the second half of today's show, Digital Logic. This is the most fun session in this entire course because this is how stuff works under the covers. And how stuff works is fun. So the guy who looks like his teeth hurt on slide two is George Boole, British mathematician who died at about the time of the American War between the states. Boole made a number of contributions to both mathematics and to philosophy. The one that is important to those of us who are studying computing is the Boolean algebra. And that is an algebra over finite sets of discrete values. The ordinary algebra um, operates over continuous values, real numbers, and generally over infinite ranges. The Boolean algebra operates over finite sets. I can count them. I can enumerate them. Of discrete values, I can enumerate the values. The switching algebra is a special case of the Boolean algebra. Um, discrete values, there's still discrete values, but now there's only two of them, 0 and 1. The variables in the switching algebra can be only 0 or 1. Um, Boole was using 0 and 1 to represent false and true. We're going to use them to represent binary numbers and sometimes to represent false or true. So the switching algebra is an algebra over sets of binary digits. And what this means is that some of the stuff that we have been doing with binary digits already can be proven mathematically. We can um, devise lemmas and theorems and prove them. We're not going to do very much of that, but we can. And that's an important thing. When computing types talk about the switching algebra, they often call it the Boolean algebra. So when you hear a computer person say Boolean algebra, almost always they mean the switching algebra. The functions of Boolean variables are either 0 or 1. Um, switching algebra, right, even though I'm calling it Boolean algebra. And the result is either 0 or 1. So if we have a function f of a and b is equal to a times b, implied, implied multiplication going on in there, a and b can only be 0 or 1. a times b will be 0 unless both a and b are 1. 0 times 0 is 0, 0 times 1 is 0, 1 times 0 is 0, 1 times 1 is 1. That is what the Boolean algebra or switching algebra calls the AND function or Boolean product. The function of A and B is 1 if and only if both A and B are 1. This is cool stuff because I can take this and prove stuff with it as we go along. Um, Boole did all of this stuff with, with mathematical-like notation, so used implicit multiplication, a, b, concatenated, or maybe a center dot, a dot, b. A Polish mathematician, Jan Łukasiewicz, represented the same idea with something called a truth table. And there are a couple of things to notice about slide five. The left-hand side, the columns labeled A and B, are in ascending order if you looked at them as binary numbers. There's only one right way to write a truth table, and that is with the left-hand columns in binary ascending order. So if you look at A and B, that's 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, that's a 2, 1, 1, that's a 3. So the left-hand side is 0, 1, 2, 3 there. The right-hand side is the function result. This is the AND function again, or Boolean product. 0 times 0 is 0, 0 times 1 is 0, 1 times 0 is 0, 1 times 1 is 1. So you can look at the truth table, at Łukasiewicz's truth table, 
and see possibly more clearly what's going on with the Boolean function. Now, I told you, I'm on slide six, told you a minute ago that the left side of the truth table is always written in ascending order. If it's always written in ascending order, I don't need it at all, right? It's always the same. And so I can talk about the result column, the F column, as being the characteristic number of a function. And if I read it from top to bottom and write it out from left to right, the characteristic number of the AND function is 0, 0, 0, 1. See how I did that? Took the truth table and just started reading at the top of the function result and wrote it down as a four-digit binary number. If I happen to have three digits of input, well, then I would have two to the third, um, which is eight rows in my truth table, and I'd have an eight-digit binary. For um, two, for Boolean functions of two variables, there are only 16 possible functions. And the why of that should be luminously clear from the truth table on slide seven. The characteristic number of a Boolean function of two digits is four bits. How many combinations of four bits are there? Two to, the two to the fourth. How much is that? That's one of the ones you memorized. Sixteen. That's all the possible functions there can be of two variables. Remember finite sets, discrete values, the finite set of Boolean functions of two variables is 16 of them. That's all there are. Now, you won't find this in any book anywhere. I'm on slide eight. Um, you'll find parts of it. But these are Brown's categories. And I say that there are four categories of Boolean functions of two variables. Computationally complete functions, which we will define before the day's over some number of generally useful functions, a few special purpose functions, and two useless functions. There are two computationally complete functions, too. So that's four, and there are 12 that fit in the other categories. Here is the AND function again. F of A and B is true only when both, and I'm used true in one, and false in zero, interchangeably. Okay? True in one, false in zero, interchangeable. And whether it's a true or a one kind of depends on how we are using the function. And I think that will become more obvious as we go along this afternoon. I hope it's obvious by the end of, of the day today. Here's our end function again, um, true or one, only when both A and B are true or one. The end function is called the Boolean product. You uh, read the supplement, which was an online chapter of the book. That uses the center dot. I learned to use concatenation, so AB is A times B. In the supplement, it's A dot B and they mean the same thing. The OR function is true when either A or B or both of them are true. True and one, same thing. Zero and false, same thing. So when A and B are both zero, A or B is a zero. When A is a 0 and B is a 1, A or B is a 1. When A is a 1 and B is a 0, A or B is a 1. And when they're both 1s, A or B is a 1. The OR function is called the Boolean sum, and it's written with a plus. The plus, in this case, is not arithmetic addition. We've essentially overloaded the same sign 
to mean the OR function. So 1 OR 1 is 1. 1 arithmetic plus 1 would have to be 2. Plus has a different meaning. The NOT function is a function of one variable, and it's the inverse function. Remember flipping those bits? Ha! We have a Boolean function that describes flipping a bit, and it's the NOT function. If a is a 0, f of a is a 1, and if a is a 1, f of a is a 0. The NOT function is also called the Boolean inverse, and we represent it with an overbar. Um, the overbar is called an overbar, but it's pronounced not. So on slide 11, that would be f of a is not a. The exclusive or function is kind of like or, but a little different. It's true when a is true or when b is true, but not when both of them are true. So a is a 0, b is a 0, a x or b is 0. But if a is a 0 and b is a 1, ex a exclusive or b is a 1. If a is a 1 and b is a 0, we get a 1. But if they're both 1s, we get a 0. The Boolean algebraic symbol for exclusive or is the circle plus. And the exclusive OR function is also sometimes called the ODD function. If the number of ones on the left-hand side is ODD, then the function is true or 1. But if the number of ones on the, the left-hand side is even, the function is false or 0. No ones at all in the first line. No ones, that's an even number. Two ones, that's also an even number. The two in the middle, those are odd. One each. Okay? Here are the two useless functions. You won't find those anywhere in any textbook. The names are made up by me. The never function never gives you any output, no matter what happens at the input. And the always function always gives you a one, no matter what happens at the input. These are both useless. Never do I always want to compute 0 or always want to compute 1. I want to do something with my inputs. Hey, Claude Shannon, um, who you know a lot about because of your homework, um, started out working with telephone stuff. And in his master's thesis, which has been called the most significant master's thesis of the 20th century, this is hot stuff, okay, showed that you could use the switching algebra, um, the two-valued algebra of George Boole, to simplify telephone switching circuits. That's a big deal. If I can simplify, and in 1937 telephone switching circuits were made out of mechanical relays. If I can simplify those, they're cheaper to build, but they work the same. If I simplify the Boolean equation, then I build the circuit that is specified by the simplified equation, not the circuit that I started with, and I save money. A lot of money. In order to show that, simplify, that switching circuits can be simplified, Shannon had to show that switching circuits can compute Boolean functions. So in one sense, all of the stuff that we do with ones and zeros inside of computers came about as a result of Claude Shannon's master's thesis. Now, <clears throat> let me say <clears throat> that if Shannon, Shannon hadn't invented this stuff in 1937, somebody else would have in 1938. This was the because it's time period 
for this material. Uh, a whole lot of inventiveness went on before, during, and immediately after World War II. And you saw that on the first day when we looked at, at that timeline. So slide 15 shows us a couple of electric circuits. I've got a battery, a lamp, and two switches. And electric circuits are called circuits because they're energized and something happens when there is a connection from the negative side of the battery, that's the one with the minus on it, all the way through and back to the positive side. So a circuit all the way around, like a circuit around the racetrack, or if there's any runners in here around the cinder track. Um, man, I used to get out there and pick them up and put them down, but not anymore. Um, the circuit shown on slide 15 computes the AND function. The lamp lights when switch A and switch B are closed, but only when they are both closed. Slide 16 shows a circuit that computes the OR function. Either A or B allows a complete circuit from the negative side of the battery through the lamp um, in the bottom drawing through switch A and back to the positive side. It could flow through switch B just as easily or through both of them. So that one computes the OR function. Cool, very cool. A transistor, a transistor is invented by Bardeen, Britain and Shockley at Bell Labs in 1947. So the transistor will soon be 70 years old. Um, transistors can function as electrical switches. Shannon was using mechanical relays. A magnet moves an iron bar and opens and closes contacts. And the time that it takes for that lever to move and open or close the contact it's measured in milliseconds, thousandths of a second, nanoseconds, billionths of a second with transistors. So much faster. Um, this one computes the not function. The output is one or true or on when the input is off and vice versa. Now what's going on there is V sub CC is the supply power voltage. This is almost all the electrical engineering we're going to do. So just bear with me for a minute, okay? V sub CC is the power supply. The sawtooth thing is a resistor. Its job is to limit the amount of current that can flow through that circuit. The transistor, when it turns on, connects the the output and the, and the end of the resistor there to the circuit ground to the return. And when the output of the resistor is connected to ground, well, there's no voltage there. It's a ground potential. But when the transistor is open, current can't flow through the resistor, and the output is at the voltage level of V sub CC. Okay, that's the first five minutes of Digital Logic 1 in case you decide to go over to the other building and be an electrical engineer. And that's almost all we're going to do. You'll see a diagram like this again a couple of times, but not very much more. The takeaway from slide 17 is that transistors can function as switches and can compute Boolean values. This is the simplest one, the not function, but I can build something that computes AND, OR, XOR, and the other functions that we're going to talk about. If this stuff has rung your chimes, there are a couple of web lectures with links on slide 18. If this didn't ring your chimes, well, you can ignore the web lectures on slide 18. But I do want to point out that funny looking diagram on the left hand side because it is 
a physical analogy to the not function that we showed with the transistor. If I have up at the top a very big water supply, like one of those water towers, right? And a pipe with a constriction. When the valve at the bottom is closed, no water is flowing out, the two meters will show the same pressure. Pressure will be equalized. You believe that? If there's no flow, the water pressure above the constriction and the water pressure below the constriction will be equal. If I open the valve, as is shown on the slide, and allow water to flow out, the pressure on the outside of the constriction will be lower because water is flowing out. That's what was going on with the transistor on the previous slide. All right. So we have these digital logic gates. We've talked about AND, OR, XOR, and NOT. And inside of them are transistors, the diagrams that I'm going to show you for the inside, and I think there's only one or two more, are grotesquely oversimplified. An electrical engineer would laugh at me. But they don't need to be in electrical engineering detail because that's not what we're doing. We're going to apply that, that tool that is abstraction and use some special symbols to represent the electronic circuits without worrying about the transistors that are inside. And so the NOT function is a triangle with a circle at the output. That circle is called a negation bubble. And it says the output will be the inverse of what we thought it might be. The AND function, 0001, is a bullet shape. The OR function, that's a shield or a Star Trek communicator. Um, that is a 0111, remember, if either A or B or both of them. Exclusive OR is the OR symbol with a band or a chevron or whatever you want to call that on the input to designate exclusivity. And you know, I didn't say this when we were looking at XOR, but what's exclusive about it is it is true when either A or B, but not both of them, excluding both of them. It's true when A or B, excluding both of them, are true. Here's the NOT function again, slide 20. There's its truth table. F of A is equal to NOT A. And we see the digital logic symbol, the triangle with a negation bubble at the output. Electrical engineers use that triangle symbol uh, to represent an amplifier. The AND function, 0001, F of AB is A times B, the Boolean product. And we have the bullet symbol for the AND function. The OR function, 0, 1, 1, 1, F of A and B is equal to A OR B. That's the Boolean OR. It's the, the uh, symbol's a plus, but it's read as OR. And the, the digital logic symbol is the shield symbol, or maybe the Star Trek communicator that, that beat me up, Scotty. Exclusive OR, circle plus for XOR, true when either A or B, but not both of them, excluding both of them, so 0, 1, 1, 0. And the symbol is the OR symbol with a chevron across the two inputs. All right, now we have a collection of four digital logic gates, NOT, AND, OR, and XOR. We can compute stuff with them. Boolean algebra, George Boole's stuff, as processed by Claude Shannon's master's thesis, deals with operations on binary digits and produces binary results. I can represent arithmetic operations, and we're going to do that with addition in just a minute. 
I can represent arithmetic operations as truth tables. Now, the last bullet on slide 24, I'm about to make a bold statement. You can build a digital logic circuit to compute any function, any function for which you can write the truth table. Now, we are not going to prove or even demonstrate that in this class, because this is the one that's a mile wide and an inch deep. If this were a computer architecture class, we'd do it. We'd write some truth tables and build the functions. If this one rings your chimes, type sum of products digital logic into Google, and you will find the algorithm for building a digital logic circuit to compute any function for which you can write the truth table. And it uses AND gates and OR gates. Um, remember, OR is the Boolean sum, AND is the Boolean product. So sum of products. Now, slide 25 you've seen before. It's binary addition with A and B as addends and S as the sum. 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 0 with 1 to carry. And since we're interested only in the sum part, the carry is sort of grayed out there. So 1 plus 1 is 0, but with 1 to carry. Man, oh man, that's exclusive or. 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 0, but with 1 to carry. I can compute the sum of two binary digits with an exclusive OR gate. How cool is that? Dead silence. You know, I do this whole thing with 30 Girl Scouts. These are eight years old, right? And I say, how cool is that? And I get 30 piping voices saying, very cool. On the other hand, we probably don't do it at 7 o'clock in the evening either. And then there's the carry. Um, 0 plus 0 gives us no carry. 0 plus 1 gives us no carry. 1 plus 0 gives us no carry. 1 plus 1, we have a carry. That's the AND function. So I can compute sum and carry of two bits using an XOR gate to compute the sum and an AND gate to compute the carry. Slide 28, somehow the slide number has slid. Um, it's over on the left. It shows sum and carry together. So this is a double barrel truth table with the inputs on the left and two different outputs, sum and carry out. That's C sub O, because later we're going to have a carry in C sub I. Okay, this may be the coolest thing in the entire class, in the entire course, all semester. That is the digital logic circuit that is a half adder. It takes in two bits, two binary digits, and produces two other bits, the sum and the carry. That computes the function that we saw when we wrote out binary addition. This is why computers work, is that we can do things just like this. How cool is that? Dead silence. I'm going to bring a dozen or so little Girl Scouts in here. See how that goes. Okay. We might ask ourselves, how do we know? That's always a good question to ask when the professor asserts something without proving it. Um, how do we know this computes the sum and the carry? And on slide 30, I have the, the double barreled truth table um, that I showed you a little bit ago. And I have the half adder circuit. And you can look and see that S in the truth table is the XOR function. The characteristic number there is 0110. 
And you can see that C sub O, the carry out, is the AND function, the characteristic number 0001. So you should be able to look at this either right now or in the privacy of your home later and convince yourself that this circuit really does do Boolean addition, two bits in, and a sum and a carry out. Now, the problem is that two bits in and sum and carry out doesn't really do what we want to do. We need at least to be able to account for a carry in. So we add one more item to the addition table. Um, the first, the leftmost three on slide 31 should be very familiar to you. The last one, the one we add one plus one plus one, that's three, a one in the ones place and a one in the twos place, or a one in the sum and a one in the carry out. Okay? Y'all believe that last column? You already believe the first columns, right? If we write that as a truth table, I told you a little bit earlier that a truth table of three variables would have two to the third rows. Um, that's eight. So here's a truth table on slide 30 with eight rows. The inputs are A, B, and C sub I, the carry in. The outputs are sum and carry out. And you can read down it. I, uh, well, let me do at least the first and last row. 0 plus 0 plus 0 gives a 0 sum and a 0 carry out, okay? Um, and the last row, 1 plus 1 plus 1 gives 1 as a sum and 1 as a carry out. And you could trudge through the rest of them. You want me to do that or do you want to go home? I want to go home. Okay. Um, but on your own, with the slides in D2L, trudge through the rest of them and convince yourself that that truth table represents addition with a carry in. And remember, I said if I can write a truth table for it, I can build a digital logic circuit that computes it. So I can build a digital logic circuit that computes addition with carry in. If we look at just the sum part of the truth table, on slide 33, carry out is kind of grayed out there because we're interested only in the sum. And we're interested only in those rows where the sum is a 1. And if you analyze that, that is actually it, it is a 1 when the number of inputs is odd. Sum is a 1 when the number of inputs is 1 or 3, but not when the number of inputs is 2, when the number of input 1s. All right, did that come out in English? I sort of, not so much. All right, let's try it again. The sum column, S, in the truth table on slide 33, is a 1 when the number of 1s on the left-hand side, on the input side, is odd. Sum is a 1 when the number of 1s in the input is odd. Well, remember, exclusive OR is the odd function. And we only have a 2 input XOR, so I need 2 of them. The sum is a XOR B XOR C sub I. And you can convince yourself of that by slogging through this table. For the moment, I want you to just believe me, okay? Two XOR gates. I'm on slide 34. The gate labeled V, like Victor, computes A XOR B. A and B in, A, X, or B out. The gate labeled W computes V, that's A, X, or B, 
computes V XOR C sub I. And so the two XOR gates together compute the sum part of addition with carry in. Let's look at the other column. I've grayed out, I'm on slide 35, I've grayed out sum. Carry out is a one when both A and B are true, or when C sub I and one of A or B is true. So both A and B, or C sub I and one of A or B. Okay, the rows that are highlighted. The gate Y, W and V, V and W were there before. I've added in a Y. Um, y computes A, X or B and C sub I. X computes a and B. We're almost there. We're almost there. The trouble is I have two carry outs, two C sub O's, and when we look back at the truth table, I said carry out was true if A and B or A X or B and C sub I. So I need an OR gate to do that OR part of the description. And I plug in an OR gate, that's Z. Z computes a um, X or Y. And now I have a digital logic circuit that is called the full adder. It takes three inputs, A, B, and carry in, and produces two outputs, a sum and a carry out. And now, watch carefully, there's nothing up this sleeve, nothing up this sleeve. Slide 38. Now I can show you why the other thing was called a half adder. Two of those and an OR gate, two half adders and an OR gate give me this thing that is called a full adder. Y'all believe that full adder does what I tell you it does? Nod heads up and down, please. I just want to know if you believe it. Only two-thirds of you believe it. Ask me a question. I'll still get us out of here on time. You can ask me questions. I want to go home. I'll get us out of here on time, no matter whether you ask me questions or not. Okay, I won't pick on you anymore today. All right, here's the good news for us, slide 39 abstraction. As soon as we convince ourselves that a full adder does what I claim it does, we are done with the digital logic. I draw a box around it, I label it full adder, and I say, no more digital logic. How do you like that? That box has inputs A, B, and C sub I, and outputs S and C sub O. And I no longer care what's in it, because what's inside it has become an unnecessary detail. It was necessary while we were convincing ourselves that it works. But now that we convince ourselves that it works, we can abstract away Two XOR gates, two AND gates, and an OR gate. Just draw a box around them. Now, what can I do with this full ad? Ta-da! Slide 40. There is a four-bit adder. This one I do want you to pay close attention to. On the left-hand side, the carry in is connected to logic zero at all times because there's no carry-in on, I'm sorry, that's the right-hand side, isn't it? Duh. Dyslexia is setting in as I get late. On the least significant digit, K 
carry m is connected to logic 0 at all times, because there's no carry m in the least significant digit. Then I have the digit 0 um, for a and b, so a sub 0 and b sub 0. That produces a sum, one, one bit of sum, s sub 0. Now watch what happens. The carry out of the least significant digit is connected to the carry in of the next digit. And the next one adds a sub 1, b sub 1, and the carry in from the zero digits to produce s sub 1, and another carry out that goes to the next adder produces s sub 2, and another carry out. And the leftmost full adder produces the, the fourth bit of the sum, s sub 3, because we started with zero, and a carry out. So there's a four bit adder. How would I make an 8-bit adder? Add more adders? Add more full adders. Eight of them will give me an 8-bit full adder. 64 of them will give me a 64-bit full adder. Now, we don't really make 64-bit full adders that way for reasons that I'll explain in a moment. But theoretically, here's a 4-bit adder. I can make an n-bit adder adder with one full adder for each bit, where n is any number that I choose. And we'd like it to be a relatively small number for reasons that will soon be luminously clear. The output of a digital logic gate, and, or, XOR, and not, depends only on its inputs. The implication of that is that digital logic gates have no memory, which we'll get to in a minute. Here's the important thing. I told you that the relays that Claude Shannon was working with took milliseconds, thousandths of a second, to change state. Transistors change state in nanoseconds, billionths of a second, but not in zero time. They change state very fast. But there's still a delay from the time the input of a gate changes until the time the output of the gate changes. OK? Input changes. Time passes. Might be some number of nanoseconds, but time passes. And later, the output changes. So let's look again at our 4-bit adder. We start on the right hand side with a sub 0, b sub 0, and a logic 0. Let us assume that it takes 10 nanoseconds for signals to propagate through that rightmost full adder. OK? That means that 10 nanoseconds after we apply all of the inputs, um, a sub 0, a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, all the Bs, um, 10 nanoseconds after that, S sub 0 will be correct. Also, the carry out of full adder 0 will be correct. And that means not until 10 nanoseconds will the carry in of the next adder be correct. And then 10 more nanoseconds, S sub 1 will be correct, and the carry out of the second full adder will be correct. 10 more nanoseconds after that, S sub 2 will be correct, and its carry out will be correct. And 10 more nanoseconds after that, S sub 3 will be correct, and the final carry out will be correct. This thing is called a ripple carry adder because the ripples, the carries, ripple from least significant digit to most significant digit. And the time of each ripple is the gate delay through one full adder. So if it takes 10, 20, 30, 40 nanoseconds for this 4-bit adder to produce a correct result, how long would it take for an 8-bit adder? 80 nanoseconds. 
And for a 64-bit adder, 640 nanoseconds. That's a very long time. And so we make more complex circuits if we're going to add more than about 8 bits. We can use a ripple carry adder for 2, 3, 4, maybe up to 8 bits. And then we start doing circuits that are more complex to gain speed. There's no such thing as a free lunch. We pay for our speed with more transistors. The ripple carry adder is about the simplest adder there is. But it's cool. It is very cool. So I'm introducing new digital logic gate on slide 43. This is the NAND gate. NAND is a contraction of not AND. Remember that the characteristic number for AND was 0001. If I ran that through a NOT gate one bit at a time, I'd get 1110. That is the NAND gate. Its symbol is the AND gate symbol with that negation bubble. At the, at the output. And its Boolean algebraic expression, that overbar is read not, so it is not A and B. We have yet another one, the NOR gate. Remember that OR was 0, 1, 1, 1. The inverse of that is 1, 0, 0, 0. That's the NOR function. The symbol is an OR gate with a negation bubble, and the Boolean algebraic expression is read not A or B. Two more types of gates. These are important to us because NAND and NOR are computationally complete. The property of computational completeness means that I can compute any digital logic function using only one type of gate if that type is computationally complete. So NAND and NOR are the two that are computationally complete. And that means that I can compute any function using only NAND. I can compute any function using only NOR. Now they're going to be arranged differently. My adder is going to look much different if it's done only with NAND or only with NOR. But I can still compute any function. The practical value of that is that the semiconductor engineer can blow a pattern of NAND gates onto silicon, wire them up to compute anything. This is more very cool. But we don't have enough Girl Scouts to do that. OK. I told you that we were almost done with electrical engineering. Slide 46 says that a NAND gate in its simplest form, and an electrical engineer would really laugh at this, but a NAND gate in its simplest form is two transistors in series. And if they are both conducting, the output is off. If either one of them or both is not conducting, then the output is on. So remember that characteristic number 1110. We get a zero output off only when A and B are both one. Now, slide 47. This is more cool stuff. Our AND gate up at the top has the characteristic number 0001. So looking at the left-hand side of the table, A and B, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. We get a 1 or a true out. I'm not sure why my overbars have slid, but they did. I told you I can compute anything using either NAND or NOR. And here's where I show you. I can compute the AND function with three NOR gates. The, if I put the same input on both sides, both input sides of a NOR gate, it acts like a NOT. It acts like an inverter. So, man, that NOT, 
Okay, I'm going to have to straighten out the over bars. That um, truth table should have A, B, not A, not B, not A or B. And I don't know why they slid over like that. But the first two XORs, I'm sorry, the first two NORs compute not A and not B. And the last one computes not A or B, which if you trace through it, turns out to be 0, 0, 0, 1. We've computed the AND function with three NOR gates. Um, if I send the same thing into both sides of a NAND gate, NAND also acts like an inverter. So NAND computes not A and B. That gives us the characteristic number 1110. If I invert that, I get 0001. I compute the AND function using two NAND gates. All right, I'm not saying how cool is that anymore. All right, but there is something to think about. If I can compute any Boolean function using only NAND or only NOR, then we might want to wonder why we bother with the others. And the answer is abstraction. We want our designs to be clear, so we want to show in the diagrams the logical function, not the internal structure. But just as we don't bother drawing the transistors, I don't want to draw an AND gate that's made out of three NORs. I just want an AND, okay? And we'll let the engineers figure out that they need three NORs to do that. When the circuit gets fabricated, it's the semiconductor engineers that use that principle of circuit equivalence to convert the logic diagrams to physical gates. All right, now I told you a few minutes ago that the output of a digital logic gate depends only on its inputs. We change the inputs, the output changes. Um, and that's true when we wire them up, as long as there is a flow from top to bottom or left to right. The output of that adder depends only on its inputs. Inputs change, adder computes the sum of the new inputs. A circuit like that, a circuit whose output depends only on its inputs is called a combinational circuit. I think Professor Englander calls that a combinatorial circuit in the supplement. They are the same thing. It's the same idea. Um, the implication, output depends only on input. The implication is that combinational circuits have no memory. And that's kind of bad because we want our computers to have memory, right? A sequential circuit can be made out of the same digital logic gates. I'm on slide 50. Um, through the concept of feedback, if you look at that circuit, there's two NOR gates, and the output of the upper NOR gate is fed to the input of the lower one. The output of the lower one is fed to the input of the upper one. And what's going on there, um, the circuit is changing so fast it might be hard to tell. But when the S input is on, Q comes on and stays on. Q remembers S, even after S goes off. When R comes on, Q goes off and not Q comes on. And then it stays that way until we see another S. Um, the, man, that slide is ugly. The line spacing somehow is ugly. The result when S and R are both on is undefined. This thing is called an SR latch, and S stands for set, R for reset. Set comes on, Q comes on and stays on until R reset turns it back off. This circuit has memory, and it has memory because of feedback. 
the circuit on slide 51 is called a D latch. Um, having S and R is really kind of not convenient. But if you look, the D latch is made out of an SR latch, a couple of AND gates, and a NOT gate. And what's going on there is the value at D, whether it's a 0 or 1, gets sampled when the value at clock is a 1, and it gets saved. If these are 1, the S on the SR latch gets activated through the AND gate, the upper AND gate and clock being on. If these are 0, well, that inverter down below clock turns D into a 1. The 1 flows through the AND gate when clock is high and operates the reset input of that SR latch. So now I can store one data bit. D is data, rather than having to deal with S and R. I move that into the control circuitry. So the, S, the D latch gets rid of set and reset, stores one bit of data, but only when it's signaled by the clock to do so. The reason we need the clock is remember that um, ripple carry adder, I don't want to store the output until the sums have all become correct and the carry has rippled all the way to the end. So we would set our clock speed to generate a clock pulse when the addition is complete. That's when we would store the result, rather than potentially storing an incorrect intermediate result. And so the value of the clock in a computer is not to speed things up. It is to slow things down, to wait until a computation through digital logic, through combinational circuits has been complete. We wait long enough for the computation to be complete, and then we signal the circuitry in our D latches or other storage, now store the result, having waited until the computation is complete. So another motto, there is no magic. Everything that happens in computers happens because of hardware and software designed by engineers and computer scientists. Now there's a lot of going on going on with me recording my voice, showing you PowerPoints, projecting them. But there's no magic. If you delved deeply enough into any piece of this, you'd find understandable software. We haven't gotten to software yet. And understandable digital logic. Are we going to finish this class designing computers? No. Are we going to finish this class with a pretty good grip on what happens inside them? I hope so. That's the plan is for us to have that pretty good grip. And not only did you get your 10 minutes back, you got some more minutes than that. That was because we didn't slog through those two eight-row truth tables. Slogging through the eight-row truth tables has become homework. You still have to do it, OK? Anybody have any questions? Really? Miss Kimberly Turner would say, Professor Brown, when are you going to sit down and let us out of here? But that isn't the kind of question I was looking for. I'll sit down and let you out of here right now. Have a good weekend. Don't forget you have work due. And I'll see you on Tuesday. And I'll see you on Tuesday.